The Lord's Prayer. As I was uh, contemplating what subject to use for uh, this uh, gathering, for a discourse, a sister mentioned to me, could you speak on the Lord's Prayer? And the more I thought about it, the more I recognized that that was uh, definitely the subject that I felt I should speak on. We are approaching our Lord's Memorial uh, on April 9th. And so in a sense, this gathering is somewhat of a pre-memorial gathering. And so indeed, it is in relation to our Lord and it's in relation to prayer, which is uh, so important. We've all heard the analogy that prayer is like the life breath of the Christian. How long could we live without error? Not long, a few minutes at the most. Now we can live without food and water for perhaps a, a few days, uh, food possibly uh, even a few weeks, but uh, certainly, air we need continuously. I remember when I was young and my mother would uh, help me memorize various scriptures. And I remember uh, memorizing this Lord's Prayer. And I did also, as uh, Sister Kathy mentioned her testimony, enjoyed uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer. It was so beautiful. It's the perfect prayer in many respects. At the Parousia Bible House in Brother Russell's day, uh, at one point in their service at the table, they would uh, recite the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's not that we should substitute our own prayers by the Lord's Prayer. That would become just simply rote then if that's all we did is recite the Lord's Prayer. But Indeed, this model prayer that our Lord gave includes every element of true and proper prayer. It is comprehensive. It is certainly divinely inspired. Now, along the lines of prayer itself, I'd like to make a statement that uh, might seem surprising, but that the privilege of prayer is only for the consecrated and the children of the consecrated who come under the Lord's covering providence until they reach the age of discernment and can make a decision for themselves whether they wish to give their life to the Lord or not. Well, brother, you might say, you're saying that the, the non-consecrated, in other words, the tentatively justified uh, and those that are not tentatively justified cannot pray? Oh yes, they can pray. But the purpose of their prayers is to lead to one purpose, lead on to consecration. And so the unjustified may repent of their sins, the tentatively justified may pray indeed that the Lord will lead them on in the path of righteousness, eventually leading them to consecration. But truly, only the consecrated may have that close communion and fellowship with the Heavenly Father. It is what He desires. Our Lord was a very wise teacher to his disciples. He didn't just actively teach them how to pray properly. No, they knew how to pray in the sense that uh, the Old Testament people of God uh, prayed. But uh, they observed Jesus in his prayer was somewhat different. And so he allowed them to witness him in his practice of prayer to his Heavenly Father until finally 
one of them asked him if he would teach them how to pray because they desired that same privilege. And so uh, we find that in Luke 11, verse 1, we read, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And then Jesus gave his disciples that model prayer that we find recorded in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and Luke 11, verses 2 through 4. I would like to read the Matthew account with you. Again, Matthew 6, starting with verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I will read the last part of verse 13 with a comment later. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That last part that I just read, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, is spurious. It is not a part of the oldest manuscripts. And it does give a wrong thought as well, for it implies that God's kingdom has already arrived and has been reigning during the Gospel Age, which we know is not the case. Christendom has claimed to be reigning in many respects, but we know that God's kingdom is yet to come. Now, he has set up his earthly, his uh, heavenly phase of his kingdom, but the earthly phase we still are waiting for. And so that is not a part of the Lord's Prayer. So let us now consider each part of of this beautiful prayer that our Lord taught us. Verse 9, Our Father which art in heaven. Note how unselfish this prayer is. You will not find I, me, or my in this prayer, but you do find our, us, and we. And so whenever we pray, let us keep in mind we are not praying isolated. We are part of the most wonderful association and fellowship in the world, the Lord's people. So we're, in a sense, praying as a representative of the Lord's people. Now, to approach God in prayer implies five distinct things to be proper. It implies, number one, that we possess and exercise faith in him, a mental appreciation and heart's reliance upon God. Two, that we realize our utter dependence upon him. Three, that by faith we recognize that God has made an arrangement by which we may be reconciled unto him through Christ Jesus and his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Four, it implies that we have an earnest desire to do and perform the will of God, which in essence is consecration, and finally, number five, 
that we realize that God no longer condemns us, but that he accepts us in Christ Jesus. He no longer holds our sin against us because we have not only become his friend, but uh, we have become his servant, and we're no longer viewed as an enemy by him. The next part, hallowed be thy name. The more we come to appreciate the privilege of prayer, the more we will desire to express adoration and appreciation of God's goodness and greatness. The more we come to God in prayer, the more we desire to pray to him. In a word, we could say reverence. For reverence, or the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. To hallow his name, to reverence his name, means that we consider first and foremost his will in our lives and his glory and honor as superior to one's own, either associations or possessions, mm -hmm. and every other interest in our lives. He is supreme in our lives, and Jesus is preeminent after the Father. Verse 10, thy kingdom come. These three words are an acknowledgement of the present condition of sin in the world, and indeed our own fallen sinful nature. And it also is a manifestation of faith in God and in his promise to overthrow Satan's empire and to establish his kingdom in the earth. And as we've talked before, since the time of trouble began, we do see those evidences where God is in the process of overthrowing Satan's empire as we've heard a lot about Israel and how we see God dealing with the nation of Israel in preparation for their conversion and in preparation for him to use them as the leading nation in the earth in his kingdom. Thy kingdom come also means that we are in sympathy with God, with his plan and with his righteousness and that we are out of sympathy with Satan, sin, error, selfishness, worldliness, with Satan's arrangement with his affairs at this time. Oh yes, we need to live in the world, but we do not need to be of the world. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Here we find an expression of confidence that God's kingdom will bring about the full restoration of the earth to the condition of the Garden of Eden. Isn't that amazing to think of the entire earth as it was in the Garden of Eden? And even more, that we have confidence in God's promise that he will bring man the willing and obedient of the human family up to human perfection, the image and likeness of their creator as in Adam and Eve, and that indeed Jesus had, that perfection that he displayed. Do we believe this? I believe we do. God promised it. It is sure to come to pass. But not until all the wicked are eventually destroyed and such conditions prevail 
Will it be possible for God's will to be done perfectly on earth as it is in heaven? When will that take place? Well, during the thousand-year mediatorial reign of Christ, gradually mankind will be raised up to human perfection. God's will will increasingly be more and more performed during that thousand years. Until by the end of the thousand years, every effect of the Adamic curse will have been abolished. Some will have gone into the second death, but all, by the end of the thousand years, will have been raised up to human perfection in their faculties, physical, mental, artistic, moral, and religious. Many of them will have developed perfect characters that will need to be tested. Others will have only obeyed outwardly, but will be revealed in the little season testing. But when the little season testings are completed, and as mankind embarks upon the eternal ages of glory, God's will will be done as perfectly on earth as it is now in heaven by the spirit beings. Mankind will be just as happy on earth in their perfection as the angels are happy in heaven. For mankind will have a joy to the utmost capacity. He will not desire to be an angel or to be of the church. He will be so completely satisfied with being a perfect human being on this earth and in whatever endeavors God permits for man in the everlasting ages of the future. Eye has not seen or ear heard the things that God has in store for those that love him. This petition also, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, implies full consecration. It implies that God's will is ruling in our own hearts. I've got to give a little illustration here of... Uh, Brother Jolly was talking to his sister one time, and uh, he asked her, do you belong to the Lord? She said, uh, yes, Brother Jolly, I belong to the Lord. And he said, uh, so I understand that you've consecrated your life to the Lord. And she said, well, no, I haven't consecrated my life to the Lord. And Brother Jolly said to her, how can you belong to the Lord if you have not given him your heart? Remember the scripture, my son, give me thine heart. I think that was a little eye awakening for the sister. The Lord wants to possess us, but we have to give him permission. We have to give him our heart in consecration. Thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as in heaven implies a longing for the kingdom. Are we longing for the kingdom? Or are things going along well in our life? And, well, if it's a while off, that's all right. Indeed, we should desire a longing for that kingdom. Why? Because it will be... A the golden age of blessing for the world of mankind. And do we not desire in our hearts that the world be blessed in that kingdom? We long for the kingdom also that if we prove faithful, we'll have a, the privilege of serving in that kingdom to help the world of mankind up that highway of holiness. Do we not desire that? We don't desire position in the kingdom, but we desire to have a share in blessing others. For when we bless others, we're ourselves blessed. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Here is an expression of trust in the Lord. We heard about trust yesterday. And confidence that he will provide all things needful for us, both temporal and spiritual. 
Isaiah 33, 16 reads, He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. God has promised that the Lord's people will not starve or thirst to death. But no request for any kind is made along the lines of a certain or particular kind of food, is it? Or for luxuries? No. It's merely a petition that the Lord provide for us the necessities of life. And anything beyond that is indeed of his favor. And so we need to provide those things necessary for ourselves and our dependents, if we have any dependents, and then leave the results in the Lord's hands. Whether what we receive is plenty or few, he knows what we need. Matthew. All right, let's uh, first of all read 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. Study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And so the Lord has promised to provide us with the necessities, but he expects us to do our part. If we are able, we should work with our hands to provide those things needful for our necessities and for those of our family. Also, he won't just instill in our minds a knowledge of the truth. What does it take? It takes study. Now let's read Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. Matthew chapter 6, starting with 31. Here our Lord is speaking to his uh, disciples. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How beautiful. The world is anxiously striving for what they will eat, what they will drink, what they will wear for all of the luxuries of life. And yet the Heavenly Father has the key to true happiness, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. And he's promised all these things will we receive now. We may not receive the luxuries in this life, but indeed we'll receive a hundredfold of his spirit. And in eternal life, everything that the human heart or mind could desire. But above the temporal food, the literal bread, is the spiritual bread, the spiritual food. God's truth as it is instilled in his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the pinnacle of God's gift to us is that of his Holy Spirit. Luke 11, verse 13. Speaking again to his disciples, if ye then being evil, now he didn't mean they were actually evil in the sense that they were degraded, but in the sense that they were fallen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? How precious a treasure God's Holy Spirit is in our hearts, minds, and wills. It's the power and influence in the disposition of God in our lives which he desires to give to us. And so may we pray for that Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and to enlarge our hearts. 
Going on to verse 12, we read, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus here is not referring to original sin, which has already been forgiven by our Lord's ransom sacrifice, but the sins that follow our consecration, those non-willful sins that are committed because of our fallen condition. Remember, the apostle indicated that we are not to say that we have no sin, for we are fallen and we are sinful, but we have, as has been heard at the platform, an advocate with the Father that we may come and plead for forgiveness for our sins and know assuredly we will be forgiven. Now, of course, if we sin with a measure of willfulness, we still have to ask for his forgiveness for the part that is non-willful, but for the willful part of it, we're going to be striped. We're going to be chastised for those intentional sins. Now, as far as our non-willful sins, God could automatically forgive us without our asking, but for our own advantage, he has arranged that we should keep track of and ask for forgiveness for those sins that we have sinned against him and others. Why does he require this? Well, number one, he requires us to keep track of and to ask for forgiveness for our sins uh, because it will enable us to fight against sin in our own lives, in our own bodies, and become stronger thereby. Number two, it gives us a greater dependence upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And three, it will enable us to develop the wonderful quality of mercifulness toward our debtors, toward those who sin against us. Because when we recognize our own sinful nature, we need to be lenient toward others. Indeed, the Lord is attempting to develop in us a character that he can use in the kingdom to assist the world of mankind. And one of those qualities that is of practically utmost importance is the quality of mercy. We cannot expect mercy from our Heavenly Father if we are unwilling to extend it to others. Jesus made a point of telling his disciples in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What a wonderful principle. What a wonderful condition the Heavenly Father has arranged. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation. This request sounds a little bit confusing the way it's written in the King James Version because it appears to contradict other scriptures such as James 1 verse 13 which says, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Well, first of all, we all need trials, testings, and temptations in order to develop an overcoming character. So it would be inappropriate for us to pray that God would spare us from the trials, testings, and temptations of life. It would be going counter to our highest good. The thought behind this part of our Lord's Prayer is bring us not into temptation or testing that would be too severe for us. I like uh, Benjamin Wilson's Diet Lot uh, rendering which gives it abandon us not to trial. God has promised to his people that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 
10, verse 13. If we feel like we're being so pressed by a trial that we're about to break down, let us claim this promise. And we can be sure that he will either deliver us out of that trial one way or another, or in most cases, he will grant us the grace that we need to withstand that trial and overcome. Finally, but deliver us from evil. Other translations, I think, more properly render this petition, deliver us from the evil one. We all recognize that Satan is our great adversary. We need to always be on the alert to resist him. Yet, let us not take on Satan alone. We need to realize our need of divine aid. Satan is much too great of a match for us. His cunning and power could easily overwhelm us without our Father's aid and care. For we read in Romans 8, verse 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he who is on our part than all that can be against us. The forces of the universe could all be against us. But if God is on our side, we have a majority. Dear brethren, this beautiful model prayer that our Lord gave us is all comprehensive. It includes everything indeed that we could ever hope for. And indeed, uh, may we consider this uh, prayer uh, in the lines of, if we haven't already done so, to memorize this and to indeed uh, make it a part of our lives. And uh, I was thinking how Brother Russell used to say that uh, his prayers continued to become more and more prayers of thanksgiving rather than petitions. And how true that is, uh, that as we continue to grow in our Christian walk, and we recognize how much to be thankful for, indeed that possesses the majority of our prayer life, thankfulness to God and to Christ and the numberless blessings that they have given us, are giving us, and that they will give to us in the future uh, as we prove faithful unto them. And may the Lord add his blessing.